I'll talk about the my side of the Allongé stuff. And Luca, you're welcome, welcome to add your own comments too, um, uh, because mine are my approach to Allongé is more as a technical guy rather than a coffee guy. But <clears throat> the the idea behind extracting, well, successfully extracting light roasts is that light roasts, by their nature being lighter roasted, do not give up their coffee material as easily. And so in order to get around that, or at least in order to get the light rose to give up its material, you either need long contact time with water. Uh, so longer shots, right? Slayer shots, blooming, that sort of thing. Or you need um, faster water, like more water passing through, okay? And the blooming espresso is the approach of the first, which is make a traditional espresso, but with a 30 second pause after the pre-infusion and then let that water contact time dwell for a long time bloom and then make your shot at the end and we covered that the last two weeks the allonger takes a different approach there is no pause time instead what we're going to do is grind coarsely and have very fast water flow going through it about uh, twice as much water flow as we would with a traditional espresso that was made for a light roast um, and in the end we end up with quite a lot in cup and it looks like a long black or um, any of the espressos that you would add water to, except this you don't add water because it's all passed through. And all that water passing through, instead of adding it later to your espresso, is put to good use in extracting material out of the beans. Now, the Allonger is, I consider, the hardest shot to dial in of all the ones we have on the machine. And the reason it's so hard is that when your flow rate is so fast, small changes in dose or grind will cause big changes in pressure. And just to repeat that once more. Normally when your, puck, when your uh, coffee is going slowly, you can add a bit of coffee, change the grind, and you get small changes. But when you're pounding water through there, just a little bit more coffee or slightly more finely grind, and you find your pressure just going very, very off what you were expecting. So when you get your allongé close, you make very small adjustments. Now, the next reason that the allongé is so hard to dial in is that except for the decent and La Marzocco machines that have true pressure at the puck, I don't think there's any machine out there that can make these. Okay. And the reason is, is that in order to pull allongé, you need to do a flow rate that's in the four, four and a half mils per second at espresso pressure. So a special pressure, eight to nine and a half range. If you try this on, let's say, a Linnea, that machine is going to tell you you have nine bar of pressure when who knows what you have at the puck. They have nine bar at the pump. So when you put your coarse coffee in there and it's pouring out, you're going to think you're making an allongé, but it's going to taste terrible. And the reason is your grind is probably going to be too coarse and you're not going to be actually getting nine bar. You're getting two, three, four bar, who knows? The machine isn't telling you. So if you have a traditional machine, the only way to make an analogy actually work is to first get the grind so fine that you're not getting the flow rate you want. So you know you're getting nine bar, and then just back slightly off of that so that you're still at the nine bar range, but now you're getting to the flow rate you want. That's possible, and Scott Rayo did it 20 years ago on La Marzocco and Keese machines. But with the Descent, it's going to show you pressure at the puck, and that's going to allow us to adjust our grind and our dose to actually get eight or nine bar here while still getting a flow rate that's massive. So again, repeating, allonges are about espresso pressures at very high flow rates. Um, Luca, I think what we're going to do is make some and then we'll move to you and talk about flavors and optimizing and all that sort of thing because my knowledge is going to stop at dialing this in and getting something that, that's working. Um, John, can you step us through um, like the, the, the numbers? Like what, what's the total amount that you're trying to extract? What basket size do you think we should be using? What doses? That kind of stuff. Okay. Um, with all these espressos, when I don't know what the hell I'm doing, I just get an 18 gram dose and an 18 gram basket. So that, that's the first thing I do. Um, and then uh, secondly, this is, uh, the Allongé uh, Cafe is like it because it's a 30 second shot. So we're talking about 30 seconds at something like four mils per second. So you're looking at 100 to 120 mils in the cup. 
Uh, I think we've seen it at 90 as well. We'll see uh, on the profile. I've got some notes in there I put in. Um, but you're looking at two to three times more water than you would in a traditional espresso. The, it isn't, that isn't really relevant, right? Normally we think about in-cup volume as being super important. I don't think in-cup volume for Allongé is all that relevant. I think what is relevant is hitting the pressure and the flow rate <clears throat> um, and the total time. If you do an Allongé that lasts 50, 60 seconds, you're gonna over extract because the water flow is so high, you really are getting all that stuff out of those beans. Uh, so I don't really care if you do an allongé at four or five mils per second. I think both those flow rates are probably enough to really um, take the material out of a light bean. But that would be something I would love your comment on. I have not experimented that. Like with an ultra light, does it make sense to actually up the flow rate even further? Do you have experience with that, Luca? Um, I've, I've actually not made an Alan Jag before at all, I don't think. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what this go, how this goes today. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do 18 <laughs> grams um, and uh, just prepare that over here. And if you want to talk while I do that, that's fine by me. All righty, cool, Leo. Um, so I guess, um, I guess one of the questions that I'm going to have is... Um, a little later on is what what sort of do we use as a starting point for um, like a, a grind for this so it's it's a much higher flow rate so I'm assuming that it's going to have to be much coarser um, I'm gonna have a crack at this and I think what I'm gonna do is um, I've got an EK at the moment with um, some filter coffee optimized like Malconi got old geometry burrs which is only which are only capable of doing like a 15 16 second espresso shot when they're at the touching point so i'm going to just arbitrarily have a crack at that um and i might do 18 grams in a 15 gram basket just to try and get a bit more flow restriction on that and we'll see how that goes um so john once later on maybe you could comment on grind size uh, and then the other question that I've got is, um, and I didn't put this on notice, but I'm also wondering about temperature. Um, so I'm thinking that, I mean, my, my sort of simplistic way of looking at it is whenever you've got pressure or temperature, that sort of contributes to more extraction power. You know, that, that's, that's all stuff that would increase the rate of any chemical or physical reaction. Um, and so if you're brewing at a higher pressure or a higher temperature, that'll extract more. Um, now here, we're, we're also brewing at, brewing at a higher flow rate, which should also keep the concentration of the interstitial water in the puck at a lower concentration than it usually would be when you're making an espresso, which should mean that... Um, there's a higher like osmotic potential between it, which should give it more extraction power as well. So I guess my guess would be that we should be brewing at a lower temperature for Allongé, um, but I don't know. Okay, uh, so you're, you're good to go, John, so I'll stop waffling. That's fine. Um, so I, for those of you who have niches, I've gone three coarser. Um, so three set, three notches coarser than my regular espresso. I don't know if that's going to be right. It might have to go coarser still. I have deliberately not dialed in so that those of you who are in the same position, um, that's what it is. Uh, good. So there we are. I think actually it'd be nice. Before we go too far, I've just got a question. Is there a particular uh, copper bean you would use for this? Like a, a light, is this more suitable for a lighter roast bean? Um, what, what roast level are you using for yours? I would say, uh, light to ultralight. Uh, I'm using a medium light here. That's what I've got, but that's not the most appropriate thing. Um, okay. okay, and Luca, I've, I've not really um, experienced a light roast bean or an ultralight roast bean. Where, where do we class that um, with respect to temperature or first crack or even um, the length of the roast period? But where would I... Uh, do, do we get first crack? 
Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, I I think that um, when you're looking at at yeah, like like when I mean, let's start with dark, right? Like like no one calls their coffee dark at all. Even people who have dark coffee do not call it dark. They they call it medium, and that might be like up to second crack. I reckon light is probably it's gotten lighter and lighter. Um, light might be end of first crack at the moment. Like if you're talking about something, something like a Tim Wendell bow, that might be end of first crack. Um, I think uh, John's just pulled a shot, so I'll pass back over to him. Okay. Um, so I just want to show you there is crema on that. Um, not a huge amount, but there there is. I'm going to show you the chart in a second. Uh, that actually dumb luck uh, was pretty much dialed in. So three notches from normal espresso. My normal espresso is like 29 to 32 seconds with the default profile. So I did three notches, 18 grams. Um, ah. It is 80 out on this is what the profile was set to. Um, and that was in 34 seconds. Okay. Um, What's on grind The grind size right now is on nine but that's on my niche. But let's just say it was three steps coarser than my traditional espresso. So what I use for my normal espresso is default profile. And then that looks like your, your typical, right? Slow, slowly building up espresso. Three notches coarser, um, more or less the same dose. I use 17 for espresso. I just did 18 for the Allonger. But let me show you the chart and show you why it looks okay. Okay. Oh, blooming is two notches finer than my normal espresso. This is three notches coarser. So we're five notches away from blooming. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we are. And you can see it just went straight to four and a half mils per second. Okay, the pressure went up. And as the pressure went up beyond nine, 10 bar, our flow, our flow rate slowed slightly, really just not much, like 3.7 mils, and just briefly. And then came back up, and we were basically at four and a half mils per second flat out. Okay. Now, what I'm happy to see is the pressure went up to nine and a half bar, and then it decreased. And this is sort of typical of the allongé: is that the pressure does not keep de decreasing. Okay, that's the green line. Instead, what happens? We think now we're in theory is that at this point the puck starts rearranging itself, what we call fines migration. So the small particles are moving down into the basket and it's not unusual to see a pressure rise here. Uh, and what I'm going to do next with this drink is probably pull it a little bit further and compare the flavors and, and see if I could pull it a little further on. Okay. But otherwise that, that was just luckily bang on. Um, I mean I wouldn't want to see this crash down. <clears throat> Generally four bar is the point at which you're no longer making espresso. So I'd rather that not happen because <clears throat> I'm just making filter coffee. And above four bar, the puck is still compressed and I'm getting crema and oils and emulsion and that sort of thing. Now, um, I used a clear glass so that you guys could see it, but this is not going to cool the drink much. So um, let me talk about temperature and this, this drink. Uh, don't drink an allergy when it comes out unless you've got a nice big substantial ceramic mug to cool it with because it's coming out at 92 Celsius. Um, so the Allonger is nice because you don't have to temperature profile it because the extraction is going to be really at 92 Celsius because the water is just coursing through so quickly that there's virtually no temperature adjustments that need to happen. Okay, so I don't think you'll be able to see this here. Let me actually, uh, no, if I change the brightness, it'll clear the, the, the chart. There we go. Uh, can you see the thin line? You can see the thin line does adjust. It goes about two Celsius up from our goal temperature at about 10 seconds. And then from 10 seconds on, it's oscillating within one Celsius of the goal. Oops. Uh, so the machine does not need to do much temperature adjustment. And, and look how just, 
look how crazy accurate the temperature is, right? We're only 1.3 Celsius under the goal at the beginning of the shot. And then within five seconds, we're right on it, three quarters of a Celsius above, and then really just perfect temperature. And that's the thing about the Allonger is your entire extraction is gonna be really at one temperature. And that's just not the case for normal espresso. For normal espresso, you're putting in water and then your flow rate crashes to one to two mils per second. And your puck temperature <clears throat> can't be adjusted quickly because the water flow through the puck is, is not that fast. So your room temperature puck, 20 Celsius, mixes with hot water, let's say at 95 Celsius. The slurry is somewhere in the 80s. The machine ups the hot water for you automatically to get you up, but you still got like five or 10 seconds where you're quite a few degrees under because you use room temperature coffee, right? There's just no way around that. You can use a mythos and preheat your grinds that will buy you a few seconds that has other effects. Um, and is out of favor these days to, to do that. Um, but that's what's super interesting about this. And you can use a lower temperature. So the default on the Allonger is 92 Celsius. Um, on normal traditional espresso, if you're using a light roast, you might go down 94 Celsius, for example, to, because the beginning of your extraction is going to mix room temperature coffee, beans with hot water, and the hotter temperature slurry is needed to get that material out. But with the Allonger, the water's coursing through, your puck is at 92 Celsius, right, within five seconds. So um, these things tend to be very high extractions. And what I like about them is they tend to, um, they, first of all, they're quite dilute, right? So um, this is 80 out, 18 in, so we're like four and a half to one ratio. Um, so the dilution is nice for a light roast because it lets you taste more. Um, you tend to get a lot on the nose from that dilution and any of the unpleasantness of a light roast, um, so underdeveloped or baked or those sorts of things, tend to be kind of muted because all that water flow is, has ripped out all the um, floral and fruit flavors from that. So uh, it's a technique I really like. Uh, and it's kind of funny when you do it at a cafe for the first time because they, they look at it and it just looks like it's channeling. Um, so I don't know to what extent you guys could see the shot. Uh, I might lower the tripod the next time so we, or, or maybe increase it and look at the mirror. Um, so I can show you it. In this case, it came out nicely. All right. It didn't look like it was channeling. My mirror doesn't have splats. I'm going to taste it. Might still be too hot. Um, Anyone out there with your machine, you want to go ahead and try, um, especially if you have a niche, just do three yeah, notches. Uh, I've, yeah. I've just dialed one in for the next, the next installment of everyone's entertainment. So I'll just um, flip around to it. Um, so yeah, so I've got this glass so you can see all of my sins. Um, and so I've just ground through here um, it's uh, it's 18, 18 grams. I've popped it in a 15 gram basket and there's a um, paper filter in the bottom of it um, just to see what happens. I have no idea. Let's see. So it's just the default LMJ and um, You're fine. it's 91. Yeah, you're way too fine, Luca. Yeah, looks like it. Yep. Yeah, you're just completely choked. Yep. Well, well that's great because this burst set. Yeah, which is great because I, I thought I was scared this burst set wouldn't be able to go fine enough to do this. So that's great news. Um, uh, just right, the opposite. I'll, yeah, it's great. So I'll um, I'll prepare a another one, and I'll um, I'll go offline, and someone else can take the video. I don't know. Uh, my coffee machine's in a different room, so I don't have the camera there. But um, I've just got a question: Does anyone drink this other than straight? Like, in if people order this in a cafe, do they ever 
um, have it with milk or with, with something else? Or yeah, you could put a cloud of milk in it. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't heavily milk it because it's already quite dilute. Um, it's, it's, you're, you're in a, um, a concentration range that's more like filter coffee. So anything you would do to filter coffee, I would say you could do to this. Um, I don't know how much you guys can see the color of this. Uh, it's not ultra dark, right? It's quite light. Um, and I've got like most of the cocoa-ness of this bean, which tends to come out with the espresso, is not there. Um, instead, I've got more like a toffee thing going on and a lot of fruit, a lot of passion fruit, pineapple coming out. And, and that's kind of cool because this bean wasn't doing that in espresso. Um, and uh, ah, the other thing I'll say is Allongé really tames acidity for some reason. Uh, it's, it's really good at that. Maybe it's the lower dilution. Uh, I don't know. But uh, I'm not really a fan of filtered coffee because it's usually just hard to drink. Um, so I'm going to um, do the same shot, but I'm just going to add, um, let's see. I'm gonna add a little bit of time. So here we are, here's advanced, and I'm tapping on limits there, okay? And this is currently set to 180 mils, so I'm gonna just go to 200, oops. Okay, so I'm gonna go, in theory, in cup now, we should be around 100 mils in cup. But you know, if it goes well for me, this is not a super interesting video. No one else tries. You're like, oh, look, Buckman can do it. Great. Uh, you might notice the uh, super cool poster. Thank you, James Hoffman. It's a lot better than a hunk of meat, which is what I had on the wall last week. Uh, I don't know if anyone with a traditional machine, a non-decent machine is online, but just to repeat how you would do the allonger, what you would do is go coarse and use um, either um, so do a 30 second shot course and aim for 80 mils in cup in those 30 seconds. Okay. And you basically want to run short, right? Run, run in something like 60, 70 mils. You know, you're then too fine. And then just course in slightly until in those 30 seconds, you're hitting 80 mils in 30 seconds. Um, at that point, you're making an allonger. You don't have any visibility on flow or pressure, but you should be able to pull it off. Yeah, like pretty much any grinder can make an allonger. So you could do an assetti. In fact, it's a great shot to do on a crappy grinder. Uh, I guess your personal experience, do you, well, I'm just asking for your opinion. Do you, have you used other more expensive grinders than this before? Yeah, I have an EG1, a Lynn Weber EG1, which is... Oh, you do have an EG1? Mm-hmm. Um, and I just use the niche now. Um, the, e, the EG1's got serious static problems. Um, it sprays the coffee out at high speed, so it tends to hit the sides. Um, and then you really got to work to homogenize it. Um, and the static tends to create clumps. Um, the variable speed on the EG1, I find to be mind bending. I don't, I get hugely different coffee results at different speeds. Um, so, um, I'm, uh, uh, for me, the niche is a better. Is it, yeah. For me, the niche is a better shot quality. I mean, just simply because when I grind out the EG1, I use the port filter with a funnel, and then I just have this fine sprayed powder on both sides. And I was like, okay, what do I do with that? How do, how do I make that into a homogenous, you know, dusting? Um, and, um, and if you watch their video and, you know, use their little shaking tool, they end up with a reverse volcano, and that's not awesome either. So I, I'm not a big fan um, of that grinder anymore. I'm going to sell it. I'm sure someone will not believe me and pay me a lot. At least I hope so. Um, and um, I do like the, the Mythos uh, 1. I think that's a good grinder. Um, the Peak is a great grinder when it's not broken. Um, but that's kind of overkill for the home. Um, I mean, I think there's a whole host of flat 64 mil grinders out there. Um, there was ours that we're now discontinuing. 
um, that use Italian or SSP burrs. There's a Lagum, is that how you pronounce it? Australian company. Um, that I expect will have really good grind quality, right? So the Mythos, I think, is 65, is that right? Mill burrs. Um, should be identical then. Uh, no, the Mythos is, is pretty big, I think. It's like it, 75 or... Is it that big? Like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have turned into a cynic on large flat burrs, and the reason is the larger they are, the more any uh, alignment problem will create lift at the edges. Whereas uh, it looks to me like something around 64 is the sweet spot where you can get it aligned well enough that you don't have huge variation. I mean, if you get a perfectly aligned EK, great, but the burrs are so huge, it's quite hard to do. Um, so, uh, I mean, more often than not, if I, when I was doing road shows, if I had an EK, the, the whole demo was gonna be a disaster because we cannot make an EK grind espresso. And the cafes thought they were doing us a favor, but um, uh, the decent wants fine grinds um, for a lot of reasons. Even water, uh, pre-infusion, uh, the baskets are, are tuned to it. So it wants finer grinds. And uh, the niche for me just solves that problem. But um, yeah, there's the new, I mean, the monolith. Lots of people love the monolith. Uh, that's a really nice grinder if you can get one. Um, there's the new one. I don't want to. I don't want to say that's the ultimate grinder. Um, uh, what I would. No, no, no. Sorry, I'm saying the name of the grinder is like. Oh yeah, the ultimate. Sorry. Uh, yeah, there's the new one from China that you you buy the EK burrs on, and uh, Levercraft is selling it in the U.S. I don't know who else is selling it elsewhere. Um, that looks kind of like a monolith inspired grinder. I I the problem is is if you spend three thousand dollars on a grinder, you're going to convince yourself it's awesome. So it's, it's very hard to... That is so true. Yeah. It's just everyone's a fanboy of anything that they spent several thousand dollars on. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you go on tour and you're with Rayo and he's just going, shit, 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 for two hours, then you kind of know that that grinder is shit. Um, and the next time you go to a trade show, you bring something else. Uh, hey, um, on, on, on that note, um, shall we have a go and see if this EK can cut it? Yeah, yeah, well, yours is hopefully I've alive, or you, you're going to lose your your coffee nerd card. Yeah, yeah. This this um this EK chamber is not too badly aligned, to tell you the truth. Um, but I did find out that the burrs were not flat. The last burr set that I had was really wonky. Um, but this burr set is is flat because pan's still flat. So here we go. So we're just pre infusing. So I think it might still be too fine. Yeah, so we're down around two. So we're peaking up a little bit more. So we're just poking up to three now. Yeah, and we've flattened out at about three mils per second. Um, and that's all now quite blonded. So I'll stop that. So that's um, 101 mil total weight. So yeah, I, I popped the Godshot reference on so you can see that it went a bit faster. What I did on that one was to stick to, I made it slightly coarser, um, but I dropped the dose from 18 grams to 15 grams um, because this is a 15 gram basket. Um, so this is quite good because it's showing that I've actually got a much larger range of adjustment on this grinder um, for the Alan J than I thought I would, which is great news for me. Um, and let's have a have a look at the temperatures. So yeah, it looks like the temperatures, you know, been pretty pretty close to target on both of them, although we have had a slight bump at the beginning. But even so, when you look at that bump at the beginning, um, that's actually only one degree Celsius, I think. So that's pretty, pretty impressive temperature wise. Um, so I guess I'd better try the coffee. You should it's, definitely it's really it. hot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna pull mine but and I'm gonna let, it, let yours cool and then, we, and then I'll pass yeah, it. Yeah, perfect. Through. Okay, so. Perfect. Um, 
I'm going to try and shoot. All right. It says low battery. So this is going to be the only shot we get. Spotlight the video. Hopefully you guys can see it. Um, I haven't changed anything on this one except uh, 20 mil more mils of water. Okay, so that still looks like an espresso. All right, it's not weird looking. Uh, you'll see the chart, it's behaving very really differently from the previous one. All right, so <clears throat> I think my puck prep was better on this one, is what we're seeing. So, because no change in dose, nothing, except first of all, we went higher pressure. So instead of going to nine and a half bar, we went to 10 and a half bar, which caused a bigger dip in the flow here, okay? And then what happened is when the puck degraded, it didn't fall apart as much as the previous one, right? Last one I was on five bar, and here this one just held its own at eight bar. And then same thing as before, the fines migration caused an increase in pressure here. But um, I'm a lot happier, a lot happier with this one because I managed to keep my entire allongé in espresso world, right? So I was, um, let's see, what am I, eight to nine bar? At the end, like seven and a half bar maybe, but the majority was right around eight bar. So my drink is a bit more what I expect, uh, a bit more volume, and I'm not going to taste it, but um, I'm happier with the curves on that, right, instead of the crash. The previous one tasted fine, but maybe this one's going to be better. Uh, the other thing, obviously, is that it ran uh, a bit longer, 39 seconds. So an extra or sort of eight or so seconds, seven seconds. Two reasons for that. One is we maxed out the pressure. And so we were not at four and a half mils per second the whole time. We went down to three. And the second is I made it 25% more in cup, right? Instead of 80 mils, it should be 100 mils in cup. So back to you, Luca, for your tasting thoughts on yours, which is still, by the way, not allongé. You're still too coarse. Uh, too fine. Too fine. Too fine. Too fine. Too fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 still not quite there, but um, yeah. So look, this is this is quite interesting. So I've got this one, which is the the super choked one, and this one, which is the only mildly choked one. Um, and straight away, what's what's really great about them is um, so this is this is um, fresh like fresh off the boat um, yoga chef a from you know the like the the latest harvest. Um, and it, it, it's classic washed yoga chef. It's, it's, got, it's got that sort of typical aroma that they kind of describe as um, uh, like, it's sort of jasmine, but it's sort of not because it, it's sort of more um, uh, distinctively perfumed. It's, it's almost more like jasmine coffee blossom moving almost into lavender. And it's got a lot of that in, in like, even just in the liquid, like you just, stick your nose in there and it's quite good. Um, uh, so this, this first one that was super slow, it's actually really re like quite, quite good. It's quite, um, it's quite well-rounded. Um, this particular coffee is a bit astringent. It's a bit, it's a bit fresh, it's a bit young and the coffee's green, fresh off the boat. The roaster said he reckons it'll be better once it's sat for a little bit longer. Um, yeah, this, 
this next one, it's um, it's lower in TDS, lower in body. It's it's got more of a milder type flavour. It does have a, a bit more of that astringency and bitterness that's sort of around the the back of the tongue. Um, but what it does have is um, a lot of persistence of flavour. It's like sticking onto your palate and like the like the retro nasal stuff like after you've swallowed it's it's got quite a lot of aroma that's hanging around and that I think is something that's um you can get it in in the sort of the blooming shots with light roast when you, when you have it going for longer you can get it in um you know you can get it in this you, you can get it in in some espresso that kind of thing but um to me, it, it tastes like um, it tastes like these are almost like flavors that are dissolved in oils rather than flavors that are dissolved in water, because um, I I, th I think it's quite difficult to actually get a a filter coffee. You can get a filter coffee with that aroma and flavor in it, but I don't think that you can get that level of like persistence and intensity of the flavor and the aftertaste in it that's something that's quite unique to um to sort of espresso and makes it kind of you know something that's worthwhile chasing thank you all right luca, do you from the, go on, hey, luca do you think that's the pressure entirely doing that creating that that change over filter well yeah i mean i assume i assume it, it must be um it could also be the volume because maybe what you're doing is if you're extracting into a smaller volume you're ending up with it being more concentrated you're getting more non-polar stuff that's coming through because of the pressure you're creating a, a more non-polar extraction environment that's then capable of pulling out more non-polar stuff so you could actually get different compounds being extracted into it um, yeah whereas if you're if you're extracting filter then um you know like like the the concentration of water in water is is very high you know so <laughs> you end up with with something that's like entirely polar i mean it might and there might not be a difference in the magnitude of the effect that i'm talking about but it does seem to me that there's some things that are that are pretty different um, I mean, the biggest thing between this and filter coffee is because we're at pressure, we're getting oils, which filter coffee is, is uh, filter coffee as an approach is not going to extract much of the oils. And I think if you're finding a lot more stickiness, it's probably the oils. The oils have a lot of flavor. Um, and so what I love about this technique is that you are doing a lot of water going through a light roast. And so you're getting that kind of extraction you would expect from a filter. Um, but so you're getting all that flavor that a filter with coffee would extract, but you're also getting oils. <clears throat> and so that makes this a bigger coffee than I think any other technique can do with a light or an ultralight. Uh, so that's, that's very interesting. Um, going to my two drinks here, the one that has gone out to 100 mils instead of 80 tastes over extracted. It's got some unpleasantness. And the default on the Allongé uh, was 80 mils in cup. And it's, it's got more pleasant acidity and it doesn't taste over extracted. It just tastes done. It tastes great to me. Uh, so I got lucky on the first one, but it looks like it's Raya who did this recipe. So I think the, the first thing to do with any recipe is just to do what the recipe is and then try different things before taste compare, but first do the recipe as it is. Um, there was an earlier question from Corey asking about temperatures and why are decent espresso brewing temperatures so much lower than traditional machines? And the reason is, is that a traditional machine is measuring temperature in the boiler and we're measuring temperature two milliliters above, two millimeters above the puck. And in a traditional machine, let's say an E61, the water is leaving the boiler, it's going through a huge quantity of metal and it's losing temperature. Let's say six to eight Celsius being typical with those machines. Now I say typical because if you have an E61 in an Italian bar, they're making a shot, a shot, a shot, a shot. And what's coming out of the group head is probably the boiler temperature because that 
huge hunk of metal is probably burning hot with the boiler. But if you're at home and you turn on your machine an hour ago and you make one shot with V61, you're probably 15 Celsius under temperature because your um, group head has been only heated through heat coming out of the boiler and not with any water. And so it's way, way down. Uh, this is the main problem with making consistent shots with an E61 is that your temperature accuracy is terrible. E61s are really good in an environment which is making coffee at a very specific pace. And then your group head is staying a certain temperature. And that's why, for example, the E61 group heads never have any insulation on them because they're actually meant to radiate heat. They're not actually meant to stay at heat. So heat comes out, they heat up at the 95 Celsius or whatever it is of the, the water of the boiler, and then they're losing heat. They're bringing it down to a good temperature. Um, machines that have electrically heated group heads um, like ours are going to be much more consistent in giving you a temperature. Um, so that's one. And the other is I showed you earlier the temperature chart. When you say you want, let's say, 92 degrees out of our machine, you're saying 92 degrees as measured two millimeters above the puck. So first of all, that's interaction between a room temperature coffee puck and the water. So that's the temperature we're measuring, is that slurry. And secondly, the machine is automatically adjusting the water temperature without you doing anything. So when I say I want 92 Celsius, um, I've cleared the screen, but earlier you could see a thin line and that thin line started two Celsius higher. So when I said I wanted 92, the machine was actually delivering 94 Celsius at that point, which is four degrees Fahrenheit higher. Okay? And then as the puck warmed up, the machine delivered cooler water in order to achieve the slurry temperature we're looking for. Because ultimately we do not care about the boiler temperature. Ultimately we care of the temperature at which the coffee is being extracted, the slurry temperature. And there's no other machine that I know of that has a thermometer probe anywhere near the coffee. So that was part of our R&D is, is getting to that. And then the other thing about the decent is the automatic adjustment of the water temperature. So it's, I forget how many times per second, a lot. Um, uh, the temperature is being adjusted in order to hit that slurry temperature for you automatically. And the reason is like filter coffee being, uh, filter coffee is quite successful because a lot of water goes into a small amount of coffee. And so the temperature of the entire slurry hits equilibrium very quickly. That is what we wanted to do with our machine is hit the goal temperature as fast as possible. With a traditional machine, you just um, do that over the course of the espresso. So uh, I see somebody is, uh, oh, Damien, can we pass to you? You're making a shot. Yeah, I made my first shot. That's the graph. You can see I was nowhere near coarse enough. Um, the pressure's just maxed out. So I'm just having another shot. Um, this time I've got another two dotches. Uh, coarser on the on the niche grinder, so I'll just about to pull that now. We'll see how it goes. I have high hopes. Two two notches from where you were might be just fine. Yeah, so this is two notches. That was already five notches uh, coarser than my my normal espresso shot. So. Looks pretty. Looks to be flowing a bit better. Yeah. We're still getting up there with the pressure. We're up above 10 bar. Okay, what's your flow rate doing? Uh, flow rate's on target, so about four and a half mils per second. That's exactly what we want. And it's, it's looking beautiful. It's not a channeling disaster. It looks like an espresso, just with faster flow rate. A little bit of spattering yeah. can up, but not much. Yeah, I think the pressure's just a little bit high. Um, so I could probably go another half a notch yeah. Also, so the pressure there is about 10 bar now, holding a 10 bar. So I could probably drop that down a bit. But, um, I think the pour is looking okay, starting to thin out a bit now. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, so we'll, in your um, double walled glass, we'll that is going to be burning. So careful. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it some time. But you see the, uh, the puck's got water on the top, which usually in the case to me, like there's no channeling. It's it's knocked out. Look how clean that's knocked out. So. Anyway, we'll pass it back to you. We'll let that cool a bit and we'll try it. 
What basket are you using there, Damien? Uh, it's, it's an 18 gram basket, it's, um, the VST basket. Oh yes, it's, it's one thing I've noticed, I don't know whether it's just the new machine, but I've been using the decent baskets almost exclusively, but uh, I, I pretty much have to rinse my baskets out after a knock in almost everything I've made so far, but that just may be the machine as it is. I don't know if I'll get a cleaner knockout with another basket or not. Um, you're, there's only two companies in the planet that make baskets. So it's either IMS or the other one. Um, <laughs> so, I guess so that way you're making your baskets. Yeah. <laughs> so so John, the other one, be different. Sorry? The other one doesn't actually manufacture their own, do they? Don't they? No, it's not. If you're thinking VST, they do not make their own baskets. Yeah, VST that's right. They just eliminate the one. What I like about the VST is the, um, the originalists. I'd, I'd like to see uh, Decent come out with the originalist. I gave my um, my Decent basket to my son. He, he loves it. Um, it's just I've been using this one for eight, eight nine years, this same basket. I just keep coming back to the same one. Yeah, we probably will offer uh, richest baskets. But on the other hand, um, seriously, the, you know, the VST baskets are five US, seven Australian more. There are a few holes different. <laughs> if you want a ridgeless, just buy a VST. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure it's worth me doing 2,000 baskets to sell 100 ridgeless. Uh, yeah, for sure. Just, I, I don't have to solve every problem. VST baskets are great. Um, if I could have them OEM, I probably would have just used them, but I couldn't. So we make our own baskets. Yeah, for sure. John, I have a question for you. On when you're dialing in the allonge, um, do you find yourself tweaking the grind more or the dose more, or does it? So the way the way I always yeah. work is I use the grind as a coarse adjustment and the dose as a fine adjustment. Okay. So um, like my espresso in the morning, the difference between 17 grams and 16 and seven is like three or four seconds on the pour. It, it makes a huge difference. So, um, so I might uh, alter that, for example, over the course of a week as my beans age. Uh, with the Allonger, it's gonna be even more the case. Um, I would say like with Damien's, that's at 10 bar, he could probably just not knock, um, I don't know, actually, I don't know if you're on 18 grams or 15 over there, Damien. A 19 gram basket. You could probably just knock a gram off and you would probably hit the pressure you want. Because you're, you're close. Yeah, I was actually uh, seven and a half grams, I think I put in. Um, these beans, um, they're a large bean, so they, they hold more volume for the same weight. So I, I just reduce half a gram to start. And the funny thing is, even at that half a gram, um, compared to other beans I use, um, the pour rate per pressure is the same anyway, so I'm not sure how that works. But your hand is half on the camera, by the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's gonna don't look at me. <laughs> John, what's so the a question for me dishes? regarding. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, regarding taste. Um, we drink mainly uh, milk-based drinks. I've got no idea what an LNJ would uh, taste like if uh, you had it as a latte. But uh, my, my quest to impress my friends is uh, is always up there, and a lot of them drink long blacks. So, what do you think of this as a base for a long black drink? Uh, you mentioned they come out very hot anyway. So maybe uh, with some room temperature filtered water, would you make a um, a good drink for a long black drinker? Do you think? Yeah, this is absolutely a long black. This is except except that you're not adding water. And so it's using the extra water conveniently um, for a light or a ultra light roast to get more out of it. But um, in terms of um, intensity, you're looking at your basic pour over filter coffee. Um, I am mostly a milk drink, uh, coffee drinker. I like these because the milk I usually have to use to hide the acidity or the intensity or to touch dilute it. Um, this dilutes it beautifully. So I don't find these drinks difficult to drink, whereas if someone makes a pour over for me, I can intellectually enjoy it, but I'm having trouble with the bite of it. 
Um, so I would also say a long black with a little bit of milk, I mean, or an allergy with a bit of milk, that's fine too, or some half and half. Um, but use this as, a, you know, just buy a, a small little um, half kilo of something a little exotic, something light, especially if you don't usually play with light beans, and use this as a way to just try that. And, and go, hmm, okay, I could make this for other people. It's not my thing, but people who like filter coffee are going to like this a lot. Uh, but especially for tanning acidity, that's the big thing for me. This really does a good job of that. That sounds like I should give it a try myself then. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, for what it's worth, I've actually, I actually just topped up both of the ones that I just made with hot water. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so, I mean, it seems to me to be perfectly fine to make a long black. Because when you, when you step back and look at it, like with a long black, you're going to have something that's like, you're going to extract your espresso and you're going to get 20% extraction or whatever it is that you would ordinarily get. And then that will be diluted out with water. Um, and so you'll, you'll, have, you'll have a long black where you, you might end up with, like with most espresso machines, you, you would end up with something that's maybe a little more under extracted. And so maybe you'd have a bit of a darker roast to make it easier to extract stuff and to get more flavor to it. But then what you end up is with um, something that has lower percentage extraction and has less complexity of flavor to it. So with this, what we're doing is we're running tons of water through it. So presumably the extraction is going to be very high. And had I had my wits about me, I would have measured some extraction for us. But if we do that, then in, in the sort of 80 mils or whatever that we were extracting, that still tasted relatively strong. If we dilute that out to the same sort of concentration that you would have in your regular long black, then it, it should be um, a higher extraction level. And, um, you know, and, and so it should have more sort of complexity of flavor and stuff like that. Um, and to John's point about, this was what I posted about in the forum before, to John's point about the effect on acidity, um, I guess, John, are you saying relative to like espresso? That it's- Oh, relative got, to filter coffee. Relative to filter coffee. Right, that's, that's an interesting one. Because that's, um, so that's, that's, that is a very different point. Um, what I was going to say is that the more volume you have, you know, the more carbonate, you've got in the same volume. Sorry, the more, if you have water that has carbonate at a particular volume in your brew water, then the more volume you have, the more carbonate you have, so the more acidity you should buffer. But if we're talking about the Allonger itself having lower acidity um, relative to a filter coffee, the filter coffee is going to have more volume and so it's got more carbonate in it. So there's something different that's going on there. And maybe that's the tilt in the profile of what is actually being extracted because you're extracting at pressure instead of extracting at atmospheric pressure. So you're extracting, you, you might end up with 25% extraction from an Allonger versus from an, a filter coffee, but the identity of the stuff that you're extracting will be different because the Allonger is under pressure and therefore extracting more oils and stuff like that. In, and therefore less acidity proportionally. Um, Jeff, yes. You could speak to this more than I, Luca, but my feeling is most pour overs taste mildly, have, they have some over extraction flavors. Um, and I think that that's from watching people make them, especially with these um, gestures where they vary their height instead of keeping the height constant, is that there are, there's some more agitated, some less agitated areas and that's why the pour over basket was quite interesting on the decent because then we agitate everything evenly. Um, but that, that is one of the consistent defects for me of pour overs is I taste uneven extraction, under, over, just right, all in the mix. Yeah, uh, like if, if I go to a cafe around me, um, usually filters taste pretty under extracted to me. Um, 
And I think that um, a, a lot of the, the sort of cafes around me, even, even if they're sort of, you know, very high end, um, pricey, highfalutin cafes that kind of advertise themselves with all of the indicia that you expect of, you know, very high end specialty coffee type places. A lot of them are kind of like, they just dump it in and then leave it to drain out that type of thing. They don't have that much agitation to it. Um, I do get a lot of like under extraction, like a lot of, a lot of acidity and not much actual flavor. And then you, you buy the same beans, you take them home and you cup them and there's a lot more to it that, that you never got in the cafe. Um, but, but that may well just be sort of, you know, just differences in the cafes and the stuff that we're, we're drinking at. Yeah. Um, when I've seen the pour overs get made, there's a lot of theater and a lot of waving your arms like this. <clears throat> um, and as if they're like, you know, a bartender doing big pours kind of thing. Uh, and that's just gonna probably cause channeling and lots of crazy agitation. And it, it's very random. Um, well, the agitation comes from the customer, see. <laughs> well, they're paying for theater, right? When you pay for a pour over, a lot of people are looking for that theater. And so it's, it's fun if they're acting like a bartender. Um, <clears throat> happy to answer whatever questions. I'm not going to make any more. Um, did you, um, Damien, how did yours taste? Okay, I've been tasting both um, alter alternatively. Um, the higher pressure one's just lacking, um, it, it's uh, water is like a filter copy. Um, but I've got no astringency in either of them. I think that's probably due to the roasting, but um, it's drinkable. I'm not a coffee drinker, so coffee's not something I uh, I have because I like. But you can you don't have to be a coffee drinker to taste good coffee. Um, you can pick up uh, bad tastes and, and particularly uh, defects in roast and stuff. And it's come through. It's full. I'd say it's. Uh, I haven't measured, but it's high in TDS uh, compared to if I was cupping or, or, or the. Um, the filter type coffees I've tried, um, very easy to drink. Um, the, the bean I'm using is an Indian bean that's uh, from Elephant Hills, so it doesn't have a lot of fruit taste. And um, I mainly use this bean for as a, as a base if I use an Ethiopian, so it gives good body. Um, and I think that comes out. So I think it's my impression is it's, it's getting, um, it's extracting more from the bean. Um, and it's easy to drink. Um, I'd be interested in learning more about the light flavours and try and try and explore the uh, fruit flavours and, and see how it works with that. Because I think that's where the um, where the shot would shine. But, um, that's probably the best I can describe it at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, I I think especially for people who are not doing light or not doing filter, this is a really good way to approach them because it's a it's a really easy thing to drink. Um, I will say also that blooming for me doesn't usually have much on the nose. Um, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, sorry, not blooming. Um, Allonger tends to not have that much on the nose, whereas blooming has a lot more smell to it. Um, I'm not sure what the reason for that is, but um, I feel like blooming is really open often. And these, these taste more like, or smell more like a flatter filter coffee. I'll just add also, um, I use Brewster water like this. And the way I use it, I don't brew with Brewster water. So my water is straight arrow um, when, when you use milk drinks. So I, don't, so I use a dropper. Now I've just been comparing these two. Um, it's taken me two drops of my solution, um, which is just a carbonate, to bring that high pressure acidity down to what the, the um, closer to the 10 bar shot. And I, I think that's going to make a big difference. I think if you brew this at 8 bar, um, I think it's going to reduce that acidity even further. Um, even though it's not a stringent acidity, I think it reduces it. But the problem I find is I lose a bit of that fruit flavour too when I use um, carbonate water. Now, I know Bristol water is very popular, but um, I think it's worthwhile experimenting just using straight RO. Um, I, if, I, um, if I drank Bristol water, um, same concentrate, I taste it, particularly with the magnesium um, 
it tastes funny to me and it, it could be just because I'm used to drinking straight RO all the time. Um, anyway, I think it, it'd be an interesting discussion to have and, and see how that compares. Um, I, but my point here is I'm wondering whether um, the bicarbonate and carbonates are actually uh, muting some of those fruit flavours that you guys chase with your white rose. Luca? Sorry, my space bar wasn't taking me off mute. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a really good question, Damien. Um, I don't. My my impression has been that um, I've gone more having more more um, carbonates in in the water enables me to tolerate a lighter roast that um, has more acidity in it that I otherwise wouldn't like. Um, and the light roast itself sort of inherently has more of the fruit and the flavour to it than a darker roast would have if I used the, the darker roast to do the job of muting the acidity. But um, it's a good question that I haven't, like, I haven't zeroed in on, on if I extracted, yeah, like exactly as you're saying, add the add the carbonates after extracting and see, do you get more acidity and more fruit without the carbonates or do you get the same amount of fruit and less acidity? Um, and I think um, what, what I should do is, like I do want to um, mix up a, I've, I've got to, you know, find like an eyedropper type thing or something that's good to, to do, do um, you know, your and James Hoffman's um, solution. Um, but what I was wanting to ask you, Damien, is uh, what what concentration are you using for your buffer solution that you're you're dropping? If you happen to, uh, I, I don't know offhand. It's the, the strength is going to work out the same as um, uh, as most Brewster formulas before you put it into your solution. So. This particular one I'm using doesn't have the magnesium, but otherwise the bicarbonate strength was the same when I mixed up the, the first half. I'd have to go back and I can find out for you. I'd have to go back. Um, I've yeah, just got rid of easy. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm waffling on. I don't, I don't know what, I can't remember what, exactly what strength I made it. I made it a while ago and that's gonna last me the rest of my life because <laughs> you only use them one drop at a time. <laughs> Okay. Um, does anyone want to take this conversation in a different direction? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just had one more um, thought to add, which was, um, John, you're, you're mentioning about the fines migration um, and the, the pressure peak going up. Um, maybe this is some more stuff that we can look into at some stage. Um, I'll see if I can get one of these actually dialed in sort of a little offline, but um, Rayo's theory on the paper filter, that the paper filter stops the fines clogging in the holes. I'm wondering if that's going to stop us from seeing the pressure flick up towards the end. And I, I have no idea if that's going to make any difference on flavour or not. But, you know, um, I think Stefan has, uh, has pointed out that you, you, you can get quite higher extraction if you dial it in that way. So that's, that's just my thought. So we're talking about using um, AeroPress filter paper on the bottom. <clears throat> and I think for the Allongé would be the, the, the most strong argument for that technique because you've got so much water pouring through this really fast, it's going to really move the coarse part of the grind up and the fine part down. And I've made a lot of Allongés that go to like eight bar, and then come down to six and then like go to 11 and they just, it's just, poof, and, and they haven't been so awesome. Uh, so keeping those holes from clogging probably is a really good idea. I would probably also argue for paper on the top of the puck um, because 
the fast water flow is likely to dig into the top of the puck and the paper is going to protect it. So both those techniques would be worthwhile in this case. Uh, so I, I brought some stuff for show and tell. Um, just in terms of the filter paper, I think for you Americans, you can you can get you know these sort of Wattman qualitative filter paper circles that are all pre-cut and sort of easy for you guys. Um, someone gave me this box. I, I haven't used them yet, um, but for the rest of us, what I've found is you can get this thing for all of about ten dollars. Um, it's like a Japanese. Um, you know, school kids tool thing for um, chopping up, you know, for cutting circles. It's like a compass. So you, you push down in the spike in the center and then you rotate it around and use the razor blade to cut holes. Um, and if you use one of, get one of those, you can only cut through a couple of sheets at a time, but you can get a V60 O2 and cut through three holes in these. So from each one of these, you get six filters, um, which makes them work out quite dirt cheap if you don't mind having an arts and crafts session. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that, that's been working out fairly, fairly well for me. If, if anyone wants to play around with it, you can buy one of these once for less than the cost of buying a box of these. Where'd you get it from? Um, Amazon. Um, so this one's called Alpha, O-L-F-A. It's just called the circle cutter. There's like 10,000 different ones around, but it was like, it was like 10 bucks or something. So, you know. I don't know if this says much, but I think that's the first time I've ever finished a straight coffee. It was, it was easy to drink was the main thing that hit you. Good concentration. Yeah, good concentration. There was no, um, there was no sour or there was no bitter, um, so it was easy to drink. I think that was probably the key. Yeah, so for me, um, especially if you've got a bean that's just unpleasant, it's 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 underdeveloped or just very light, um, and, and you don't know what you, what you can do with it. Try this. Especially, uh, people gift me beans all the time, and. I don't know what to do with this. So that's why they're trying. Um, what's the like with darker stuff? I missed that, Luca. What's that? Uh, what's, we've, we've sort of discussed it a bit in terms of lighter coffees and in terms of more filter type <laughs> stuff. What, what's it like with darker stuff? Does it sort of accentuate sort of ashiness and that sort of stuff? Or have you tried? It's like, not ashy. You... It's. Um... Just kind of flat. It's just boring. Um, you, if you've got something that's medium, then you might. It, it doesn't bring out burn, so you don't you don't get ash flavors if, if you're medium roasted. I mean, if you're dark roasted, it's just going to be awful. Uh, but if you're on the medium world, um, I find that if there's anything fruity, it will bring it out. Uh, so like this bean that I, I'm doing right here. Uh, the tasting notes are orange and caramel and chocolate. Um, and, and what I found was I, I only got kind of a medium chocolate out of the espresso, traditional espresso, but doing it allongé, I got some, um, some less Maillard notes. So some more toffee type stuff. If you want caramel, that's fine. I would, I would agree with that. Uh, and I, my fruit notes are different than theirs, but that's fine. Um, so it, it does work, but I would not go to medium dark. At, at that point, it, it just, it's over extracted, right? The, the problem is, is that your, the more you roast, the more easy it gives up its material. With this high water flow, you're just gonna over extract it. Um, so you need a bean that um, fights extraction a bit for this approach to be good. Yeah, so, so is, it, is it right to say that if you've got roast bitterness in your beans, then this is probably not a good 
way to be extracting. Yeah, what I have done with stuff that's just flat out medium is do an allongé, but in 25 seconds. So it's like fast, and then I stop it before it gets over extracted. And, and that can yeah. be okay. And then uh, the thing about the allongé, especially for professionals, is it's 25 seconds to make a long black. I mean, it, it's just mental. It's, it's so fast, and it's really consistent. Um, so it's like, don't bother with a pour over, just crank these out 25 seconds at a time. You, you know, this, this, is, this is actually um, basically the thing in the Hendon paper, in, in the well, recent- This is totally the Hendon paper. Yes, I agree. Uh, except that we're not pulling it in 15 seconds or whatever, we're going a little bit longer. Um, Yeah, I think any um, high altitude being um, Luca would suit this. Um, you know, a lot of the Ethiopians. I've, I've got some uh, Yemen that come through. I'm going to roast that just on the uh, light side of medium and give it a go. I think that would uh, shine with this, this profile. Um, I just had a look on my machine. I saw that there's a blooming Alan J. I don't know if that's just the, the next level where you combine the first two uh, video calls and make a uh, third one out of it. Uh, but I take it you guys are using the uh, Rayos one, yep. Yeah, so the blooming Alan J is only, I don't know, two months old or something. I actually haven't used it yet. Um, so, but the, the idea is to have a 30 second bloom time. And so you pre-infuse the pressure, let it sit, let the pressure go down and then crank water through. I think that should probably be the highest extraction coffee possible at that point. I think it would be challenging though to not over extract it. Um, I mean, it, it, you could, if the blooming, blooming normally is flow at the end, right? It's 2.2 mils per second. So if you just take a blooming espresso and at the end, instead of 2.2 mils per second, do twice that, four and a half mils per second, you've got a blooming allongé. That, that's the only difference between those two. And so um, the trick though, is that you're going to have to grind coarse in order for that last stage to not go crazy on pressure. And that's going to give you a lot of dripping during your bloom stage, which is not necessarily gonna taste all that great. So that one's direct from Rayo. I trust that he knows what he's doing. I haven't used it. We could, in fact, it'd be a good future call as we all try it and make bases. I think one advantage of doing a uh, blooming at the start could be um, to reduce channeling um, or, or more evenness because if you, all your coffee's um, well soaked, um, my theory would be that uh, you're less likely to cause a, a channeling because once you um, say you started pouring very quickly from the start um, and only half the puck was saturated, the water will follow itself, so to speak. Um, but we, because this is a high flow rate, that's probably less likely. But if, if we made this say the one mil per second, um, you could extract through one part of the puck and the other part could, uh, other part of the puck could stay dry. Um, and blooming would prevent that, I think. I think that's a, a viable theory. If my puck prep is not good with the Allongé, um, it just turns into a channeling disaster. That still tastes okay, surprisingly, but it looks god awful. Um, and, and maybe having a pause at the beginning would help alleviate that. I mean, certainly the Allongé is brutal on your puck prep. I did say it was the hardest shot. I mean, maybe the blooming allonge is even harder. I don't know. I guess I just don't get what, what Raya would think that you're going to get out of the blooming allonge that you don't get out of the regular allonge. Um, but maybe, maybe we just need some more measurements and stuff on the allonge. Um, do, John, do you have like some extraction yield measurements on Alan Jays? I mean, yeah, it, it, would, it would be pretty high, right? They're very high. We're, we're on 27. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't know how much higher you... Yeah, 
Yeah, we should, uh -huh. we should just do it. Because this is the, the Hendon paper with the, the extraction peak and all of that. The blooming is for extracting on the fine side of the peak where you get clogging, where you use the bloom to stop the clogging. Yes. And we're over on the coarse side where we're just extracting super fast so that we're not getting clogged. Yeah, I don't know. I, but I, I, I have found the allongé to not work with certain beans. They just, some beans just go to hell. Um, so we were doing, in LA, we we're doing allongés with Ethiopian and Rhea was actually bring, uh, mixing in a quarter natural Ethiopian. Uh, and those were great. And then we did Kenyans and it was just <laughs> everywhere. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't working. And the Kenyans worked much better with blooming. So I, I think the, the nature of the beans varies more than we're really happy with. And that's just the reality of coffee. And it might be that one recipe just doesn't work with a certain kind of physical reality of that bean. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, I, I um, ben, ben Chair and I worked with a blend the other week. It was Coffee Collective's espresso blend. Um, and it was um, Brazil, Brazilian coffee, Kenyan coffee, and, um, and Colombian coffee. And we couldn't hit an extraction that enabled us to taste the distinctive flavours of the Brazilian coffee as well as tasting the distinctive flavours of the Kenyan and Colombian coffees in the same extraction. There's something I've always wanted to do, and that's to be a mixologist with coffee. Instead of having a blend, pull them separately and mix them after and extract them both, both at their peak. Well, what you can do is you can dial in two single origins separately at separate grind settings yes. and then blend whatever percentage you want at those individual grind settings together. And if they'll both extract at the same temperature pressure profile, then it works. You, you just get the shot with the regular timing. And Wait, are you saying you grind two things and then mix it up in a cup and then make a puck out of that? Not even, not even mix it up in the puck. I'm saying like, if, if I want, if I wanted to do, Kenya and Brazil blend, I, first thing I would do is dial them both in individually. Like if you wanted to do it, the, the Rolls Royce treatment for it, dial them both in individually to make an espresso shot or whatever and find a shot that works. And if, if the shot that works for you is, happens to be um, say, like, like let's, let's be simple about it. Let's say it works really well on default at, 94 degrees celsius for for the brazil and it also works on default at 94 degrees celsius for the kenyan and then your brazilian coffee is like you know a notch and a half like coarser than your kenyan coffee then you can take your porter filter and grind say 10 grams or you know whatever you want 12 grams of the brazilian coffee at that 1.5 coarser Okay. And then the remainder, you know, six grams or whatever of the Kenyan at that one and a half grams, one and a half grind setting finer, tamp it, you know, prepare your puck as normal, tamp it, and then extract it at that grind setting. And you should be able to get it tasting the same as both of those extracted individually. I have you tried this? Yeah. And? And it works. Oh, that's pretty cool. It, it's just mostly I can't be bothered doing it because, like, why would you? But <laughs> on occasion, if you've got something like, you know, like you've got um, some hyper-aromatic Ethiopian coffee that has, like, no body, then you might want to blend that in and then you can, you can actually make a, a rounded type, type coffee. But it's just, you know, it, it's just, it, it's so much work. But, but that's why why you get something like, you know, a classic blend like, um, like I think, Ely's sort of northern Italian blends. It's like Brazilian coffee and Ethiopian coffee and nothing else because 
they just both inherently grind at the same grind set. Makes yeah, sense. So just I, much easier to work. I might give it a go. I might get one of uh, the Ethiopians and a good base. Um, but I'll grind them separate but, and just tap them in layers. So I put the base, I think, at the, at the bottom and the Ethiopian is a find a grind on top and tamp them separate and, and see how it goes. Yeah, because you'd, you'd yeah. often find that the Ethiopian would need to be way coarser than anything else. This is going to be the first time Luke has ever said something's too much trouble, though. <laughs> Yeah, I'm all for simplicity. <laughs> I don't mind the idea, though, of especially, let's say I had to pull three shots. I had three beans, and I just did, you know, whatever it was, 18, 18, 18, put it in a cup, mix it, and then just dose the porter filter right onto the basket. Um, and I could do three shots all the same. That but it's, it's more like... Work a copy. It's, I, I'm thinking more if you're a cafe, and you've got three different single origins that you're offering, then this could be something that, like, a cafe could, could sort of do. You but know, you do two shot. shots, mix them, and pour. <laughs> yeah, that's the easier way to do it. And you could sell somebody multiple decent machines at the same time because like you'd need more than one machine, yeah. Yeah, and then you've got the Ethiopian machine, the Brazilian, and the Kenyan. <laughs> different skins for them all. Yeah, with three niches next to them. I think it makes a lot of sense. I can see a new movie coming out, Cocktail, but we'll have to name it Espresso Tail or something. <laughs> and we'll all be dr drinking six shots at once. All right, three doubles. Cocktails. Ouch. Ben and Damien will come up with a 3D printed trough to just funnel it all into the one cup. <laughs> it's lovely. All right, we're coming up on the last nine minutes. I try to keep these to two hours. So. I've got an out there question for Luca because he mentioned it in the last uh, video call, but he says that he freezes coffee with success. Um, I'm actually wondering, um, what do you freeze it in? Uh, hard containers, uh, vacuum seal bags? Uh, what, what's, your, what's your method? Um, well, I can show you my actual freezer, but just give me a sec, I'll just grab some stuff. Yeah, I freeze my beans as well. As soon as I receive them, I have um, a backpack and I, I get them into a proper, you know, the, 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 the proper backpack bags that don't leak any air. And, and I hard vac it. Um, these beans are three weeks frozen and they taste great, opened up. Um, so when you pull them out to use them, are you, uh, are you defrosting a whole bag at a time? Or yeah, yeah. so these, these are, um, I guess, half kilos, 12 ounces about. Um, and I, so I backpack each bag separately and I take it out the, the day before I need it and let it thaw before I open it. So I, I only open them when they're room temperature. Right. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a good idea because I, I think you, you, you do get different grind settings if you go straight from the freezer. I mean, you can go straight from the freezer and grind it and it'll, it'll taste good, you know. Um, but in terms of grind consistency, as in consistency of grind setting across multiple shots, better to always be starting at the same temperature, whether that temperature is frozen or thawed. Um, but in terms of what I do... I've got some things that are just, you know, just chucked in there, um, just in their regular valve bags. And that sort of doesn't seem to hurt. That expands everything out a little bit. I've got some stuff where I split some subscriptions with friends and they pack it into this. And then, you know, we keep on chopping this down and reusing all of this plastic because, like, it's terrible. Um, and then I've got some stuff that's, like, for some stuff that's, um, cause I, like I trade a lot of stuff with people so that I can taste a lot of stuff and things like that. Um, you know, for some stuff that's like actually quite special or whatever, I'll backpack it into individual or two shots like this so that that can last for a long time. Um, but some of the biggest surprises that we've had have been um, coffees that have been 
underdeveloped. Um, and then I've just sort of thrown them in the back of the freezer, not in anything especially special, just in something like this, and you know, like with the valve in there, um, and then come back to them three or four months later. Um, and then it's, it's almost like the roast under development has dissipated, like they're extracting more easily and they've just got this like incredible aroma to them. So, so I, I, I just feel like um, the more you actually do stuff, the more you find exceptions to everything that you thought you knew and the more you throw your hands up in the air in despair and just go, yeah, whatever, I'm just going to, you know, like, just give it a shot. Well, at the end of the day, if you get a good coffee out of it, uh, there are no rules, right? As long as, uh, as long as you're not just fooling yourself into well, thinking it's a good I, coffee because of the effort you went into. The, the, the thing I want to know is I would like to be able to predict in advance if it is going to be a good <laughs> coffee or not. <laughs> that's, that's really it. Um, well, that's, that's one bit of feedback since we got this machine. Um, we can we can look at the chart and if we know the bean we've been able to say this is not going to be a bad coffee and one of the problems we were having as our breville was doing it slow sort of dying and leaking pressure and doing things is we were making coffee and some days it was coming out beautifully maybe the ambient room temperature and the seals in the breville and everything was behaving and then other days you know same same sort of thing the extraction still looked all right you know it still seemed to pour out okay and it'd just have completely lifeless, you know, bland taste. So something about the decent, which you look at that and even though they will differ, as long as you don't see any signs of sort of extreme channeling or anything like that, um, we haven't had a bad, bad coffee out of it since the first three days when we were really playing with it. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the things that's quite great about it in this, terrifying COVID-19 world that we're in is, um, you know, given that we're not like, like, you know, sharing cups with people is a little, um, is a little terrifying now. It's really nice to have the graph and know, hey, that was exactly like the graph that I just had and be able to hand over a coffee to someone with confidence that, you know, you, you know what it's going to taste like. Absolutely. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a big I, thing about the graph. For every shot, I look at the graph. Even when my wife makes a shot, um, she gets up earlier than me. I get up in the morning, I have a look at the graph. You can confirm that um, it worked out well. You know, it's, um, you can see when things go wrong. Um, it's, it's huge. Yeah, somebody who roasts too. You, if we roast beans and then we use them, say three days after, it used. To, I mean, sometimes we'd get obvious signs. You, you put it in the dual boiler and you press the button, and you just get this shower of, uh, of liquid coming through it. And they, wow, uh, you, you know, yesterday's beans, which were six days out of the roaster, everything done exactly the same, were quite different. And yeah, that variability you get in the first few days. Um, yeah, the decent. Well, for one thing that's interesting is if the flow rate starts off a little fast and the machine seems to do its back off thing, we still get a good coffee out of it. It's uh, it's unbelievably good at that. It doesn't just sort of persist at trying to blast nine bars of pressure through this uh, this puck. So yeah, we've had coffees that are sort of um, we find when we freshly roast them and use them a little too early, they come out. It, it, there's just there's not a lot of flavour there for a latte. But um, but again, since we got this machine, we've uh, we started off on the gentle and sweet profile, um, moved to the default, and just the last few days, I've tried the one that's called uh, best flow, pro uh, best performing flow profile or something like that, uh, pressure profile, sorry. And um, uh, that, that one's been magical. Um, we've really, really liked that for making lattes. And, um, and yeah, again, uh, we just find way faster to dial in a bean um, on this machine than anything else I've ever seen. I just want to butt in there. Never throw a shot out. Always try them. You'd be surprised. You know, sometimes you, you think something didn't go to plan. Um, and we we get these um, preconceived ideas in our head what something should look like. And we like pretty patterns and, and things like that. So we can look at a graph and go, oh, that's yuck. And you can try the coffee and you can be surprised. And, and from that, you can um, pick up ideas, uh, pick up ideas you should try to change and, and things like that. 
I need to learn to taste without milk because the problem is, uh, you know, if, if you finish it and make a latte, you end up chucking out 150 mils of milk along with, uh, with the terrible shot if you don't like it. Um, the key um, for me was I started adding um, water, not that warm, and just really diluting it. And I felt bad about that for the longest time. And then um, Rayo told me, no, that's how he drinks every shot. Whenever he's tasting, he's always diluting like 10 to 1. Uh, and I think that people who milk their drinks, we're a bit intimidated by the, the espresso jockeys, you know, who want those thick slurries and they drink them and they say, and then they tell you all these flavor notes from this, you know, you know it looks like melted chocolate. Um, most people can't do that. And I question how well they're doing it anyway. When the concentration, the TDS goes sky high, you just can't taste much. Um, and often you'll just taste unpleasantness. Uh, but bring that down to kind of 30, 40 Celsius with a lot of water and you'll be able to taste it and it won't be unpleasant. But that's my recommendation is bring the temperature down and get a lot of dilution in there. And you'll be surprised at how easy and pleasant it is to, to switch from milk to something else. I would still taste with your milk as well, though. Um, it's sometimes if I, particularly when I cut, um, I do a lot of cupping just to um, because I roast, trying to uh, get rid of roast defects. And um, sometimes you think you can get a nice coffee, but it won't punch through the milk. And you know, often I'll, I'll taste it. I'll just take a, a teaspoon and try the, the um, espresso shot straight just to to get an idea of what it was like, and then I'll, um, I'll still use milk. You know, I know a lot of people don't like wasting milk, but in my view, it's, it's not that expensive. Um, of course, it's not good to waste, but um, we're, we're trying to hit a goal here, trying to get the best, and um, sometimes you've got, to, you've got to test it the way you're going to drink it. And if you're a milk drinker, then you should be testing it the way you're going to drink it, I believe. All right, I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to end it. It's been two hours. Thank you, everyone. And in two weeks, I might be in Hong Kong in a hotel confined without an espresso machine. So I don't know if I'll do it or if I'll do it, I'll just lead it and you guys have to make the coffee because I have a two week quarantine to get back into Hong Kong. Why are you unable to take a machine with you? Um, I don't have, I have 110 machines here and Hong Kong's on 220. And when you land at the airport, you know, you're straight to quarantine. So um, I could have someone from the factory try to deliver me a 220 with a grinder and all the accessories. But <laughs> it's a bit much. Um, besides, you know, they're all going to think that I'm, all they're reading about is how everyone in America has COVID. So they're not going to want to go anywhere near me. Probably even after two weeks, they're going to be afraid of me. I told two of my guests yesterday that the uh, distribution tool I made, uh, I just got the needles in about three days ago and they got stuck in, of all places, Wuhan. And they're like, are you sure it's safe to be stirring your coffee with needles that have come from Wuhan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't worry, the virus all dies off in the post. It's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> but uh, but that, that's actually been a great addition uh, since I, uh, I 3D printed a tool and have waited a month for the, uh, the needles to get here. But uh, gee, that has made a difference. Um, you'd think it would make your puck prep slower, but it actually makes it faster because of all the other various ways you try and distribute or shake or do all these other things with that thing. It's just raking it across and you get a great puck out of it. Yeah, it's just the right tool for the job. And, and if someone spends a minute grooming their puck, something's wrong. Mm. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Cheers. you very much, John. Thank you.